Uh, good morning to you. Uh, let me welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and a director's forum this morning with Nasreen Barari, the Iraqi Minister for Municipalities and Public Works. I should say before I further go further with my introduction that we're struggling with the uh, temperature in this room. We apologize for it being a little cool. Uh, some of you I see are sitting there with your coats on. We're going to do our best to get that changed, but I don't know whether we'll be able to do it quickly. I want to acknowledge uh, the presence here of the chairman of our board, Ambassador Joseph Gildenhorn, who does outstanding work in leading the work of the Wilson Center. Today we are pleased to hear from someone who has a very tough job. Security problems and political transformation understandably fill the headlines from Iraq. But a less noted and equally critical story is Iraq's physical reconstruction. The needs, as all of you know, are simply astounding. Years of war and neglect have de devastated Iraq's infrastructure and eroded basic services. Restoring Iraqi cities and towns will take time and resources. The Iraqi people will have to be engaged in lifting their country up, and the United States and other nations will have to help them carry the load. Nasreen Barari will be at the center of this process, and she is also part of another critical element of Iraq's revival the participation of women in the political process. Through our conflict prevention and Middle East projects, the Wilson Center has been pleased to focus on the important role of women in Iraqi reconstruction. In a series of events, we have witnessed firsthand the dynamism and the ability of Iraqi women from city council members to the Governing Council, and we are hopeful that the example of women like Nasreen Barari will lead to an ever, even greater participation by women in Iraq's future government. Before assuming her current post of Minister for Municipalities and Public Works, Nasreen Barari was the Minister of Reconstruction and Development for the Kurdistan Regional Government in northern Iraq. She was also a member of the Economy and Infrastructure Working Group at the United States uh, State Department's Future of Iraq project. Following the first Gulf War, Minister Barari worked with the International Organization for Migration to assist in the repatriation of refugees. She also worked with the UN Department of Humanitarian Affairs uh, to coordinate relief services. She is a graduate of the University of Baghdad, where she received a degree in architectural engineering, as well as a graduate of the Kennedy School at Harvard University, where she received a master's in public policy. Her talk this morning is entitled Preparing for the Post-War post Reconstruction in Iraq, What Has Been Accomplished and What Lies Ahead. Madam Minister, we welcome you to the Wilson Center. Good morning. Director Lee, thank you for this opportunity to speak about what's happening today in Iraq. Thank you for your interest and for coming. I would like to speak briefly and look forward to your questions. I left Baghdad last Friday uh, on a small plane that took off very low, then suddenly spiraled high for security reason. Uh, it is still difficult traveling out of Iraq. Non-stop services from Baghdad to Boston or Washington is still too much of a dream. 
Saturday and Sunday, I was uh, attending a UN Habitat conference in Amman on urban development in Iraq. Monday, I had meetings all day with the World Bank officials here in Washington discussing infrastructure and capacity building needs. Tuesday, yesterday, also here in Washington, I spoke at a Rebuilding Iraq conference for the private sector to encourage businesses to become involved in Iraq. And here I am today to talk about my work and the status of reconstruction, political transition, security, economic revitalization, and the status of women. I mention these events to highlight the attention from all sectors, both private and public, that Iraq continue to receive. The making of a new, better Iraq has only just begun. The momentum is still building and needs to keep going for at least three years. It will take that long for the Iraqi people to see and feel the results of the change that formally began almost a year ago on April 9, 2003. My Ministry of Municipalities and Public Works provide essential services, what you call utilities. Iraq utilities are owned and operated by government. Iraq has been excessively centralized. Baghdad makes the decisions for local governorates to implement, but we are changing this to bring government closer to the people. Decentralization is a primary goal. My ministry focuses on over 300 municipalities in all 18 governorates. Most than, more than 70% uh, of Iraqi's 25 million citizens live in municipalities. We provide municipal services, all basic municipal services except electricity and telecommunication. This means safe drinking water, environmental sanitation, wastewater, and solid waste management. This also means municipal road work, including traffic controls and urban planning, land management, and zoning. We are responsible for the administration of some 100,000 pieces of property that includes parks, leased buildings, libraries, cemeteries, and slaughterhouses. We clean the street and cut the grass. We run more than 1,500 water treatment and pumping stations. I would mention wastewater treatment facilities, but all, in all Iraq there are fewer than 10, and none are properly functioning. The status of solid waste management is no better. Prior to the last war, we were part of the Iraqi Ministry of Interior. Unlike the U.S. Department of Interior, the Iraqi Ministry of Interior was in charge of the dreadful and much feared security services. To give essential services the attention they deserve, wiser spirits have assigned municipal services to a separate ministry after the liberation of Iraq. To highlight public issues and to promote public interest, Representative councils have been established in all 18 governorates, provinces, and in many municipalities. The councils are still new and under development. My Ministry of Municipalities and Public Works is a technical ministry. The ministry has technical offices in all governorates, capitals, and municipalities to address issues and interests highlighted by the councils. That is the theory behind the practices we are working to put in place, to work closer to the people through the municipal councils that are being created. We have a tremendous amount of work to do to rebuild, reform, and reinvigorate the public sector infrastructure. What's been done to improve municipal services? To bring the three imperative services of water, wastewater, and solid waste up to standard throughout the country would require more than $20 billion over 10 years. At least 50% of Iraqi population does not have access to adequate and reliable safe water supply. Since April 2003, the U.S. government has made available more than $4 billion to address the problem. Over $3 billion will be spent on new urban water treatment and pumping facilities and pipes and fittings to replace leaking networks to reduce water losses. 
rural water projects and equipment to repair, replace, or rebuild existing facilities will also be funded. With hardly 10 wastewater treatment facilities in the whole country, only 700 million will be spent on sewage works and 22 million on a solid waste project. The Japanese government is talking about making 260 million available for water and environmental sanitation. The German government just completed a 3 million project re-equipping the National Water Quality Control Laboratory. They also upgraded and outfitted the main central workshop for repair of pumps and motors and other equipment. And they provided leak detection equipment along with pipes and fittings to reduce water losses. Other governments and the EU are also being helpful. It is a beginning, a strong beginning, but only a beginning. That is a little bit about uh, the work of my ministry. I will now talk a little bit about security situation. Much of Iraq is very secure. The news media over-focuses on the negative, especially on isolated vicious events that have caused horrendous harm. Despite recent devastating incidents, the Iraqi Kurdistan region where I come from is relatively very secure. U.S. civilian personnel travel freely throughout the region. The U.S. military has used the region for R&R, &R, rest and recreation. Uniformed soldiers visit the region markets without weapons. Touch wood, to date, no coalition personnel, civilian or military, have become casualties in the Iraqi Kurdistan region. Basra is blossoming with economic development and opportunities. The marshes are being restored. The holy cities of Najaf and Karbala are receiving tens of thousands of uh, visitors, religious visitors per day. Yes, incidents do occur, like bad incidents, like bad accidents, sorry. But when violent episodes occur, life does not stop. Traffic continues. Offices and stores stay open. Educational institutions continue to function. Life goes on. This is the real resistance. Iraqis are very sensitive to security. They have had decades of conditionings. They take very few chances. They tend to play very safe. One of the best indicators of security is the student situation. There are hundreds of thousands of students with tens of thousands of teachers attending thousands of schools throughout the country. Parents would not send their children to school if they were not comfortable with the security situation. It would be very difficult to find a school that is not operating because of security concerns. There is a lot of rebuilding, reform, reconstruction and reinvigoration that will need to be starting. But there is a lot of rebuilding, reform, reconstruction and reinvigoration that is going on. Government and non-governmental organizations and commercial companies are increasing in number and expanding their scope of activities. Markets are increasingly lively and expanding. The security situation is under control. Economic revitalization has begun. Political transition is currently receiving strong attention. The Coalition Provision Authority, the CPA, that governs Iraq at the moment will no longer exist on July 1st. General elections are unlikely to take place until 2005. How the economy will be governed after June 30th is under active discussion. What will be the national representative body after June 30th? What will happen to the IGC, the Iraqi Governing Council? How will top executive functions be handled? Who will handle them? What will happen to the ministries? What will be the relationship between central government organizations and local government organizations in the governorates and municipalities? What do I see at this point of time? And this is purely my personal opinion. First, Iraq will continue to need, require external assistance, guidance, support, and protection. Certainly in the near term. The UN needs to play a more influential role in analysis and guidance or to demonstrate what is best for the Iraqi people. 
This seems to have begun. I believe the Iraqi transition assembly needs to be significantly expanded and that a steady executive body should be put in place. Women definitely and without question should play a more influential role in all representative bodies. There is absolutely no shortage of qualified women in Iraq. The law of administration, the interim constitution, should support bringing government closer to the people through decentralization, federalism, separation of powers, and enshrining UN conventions pertaining to universal rights. What about the role, the role of women in the future of Iraq? Let me expand more on this topic than on others. It is nearly one year since the historic moment on April 9, 2003, that confirmed to Iraqis that we are no longer threatened by the extraordinary oppression of the former regime. Since then, during a short period punctuated by turmoil, concerned citizens have made substantial progress initiating and developing cohesiveness and in organizing to better defend their rights and protect interests they deem vital to their future. This is particularly true of rights and interests pertaining to women. As the development of a new, better Iraq moves forward through alarming obstacles, the role of women in our society is being increasingly threatened. For Iraq to move forward faster, it is essential for women to play stronger contributing roles. Women need to have opportunities to, to more actively participate in decision making. In order for this to occur, an enabling environment to promote women participation needs to be enshrined within the fundamental law of administration. As Iraq moved toward taking its rightful place among the family of nations, we should do so on the basis of recognition, affirmation, and adherence to international human rights convictions as they pertain to women. We are afraid for the future of Iraqi women. The substance of IGC Resolution 137, especially the highly, question, especially the highly questionable process by which it was passed, demonstrates how the democratic process can be so easily usurped to threaten a majority that democracy is intended to serve. Resolution 137, if enacted, would reserve, reverse many of the rights and privilege currently enjoyed by Iraqi women. In order for the fledging democratic process to mature, women groups have organized that Resolution 137 be retracted. Unique, threatening circumstances are endemic in the current social cultural makeup of Iraq. Though women compromise more than 50% of the population, in order to play, play significantly increased roles in decision making, I firmly believe and feel that no less than 40% representation at all levels of social, economic, and political decision making need to be reserved for women. More than 80 women or non-governmental organizations have been organized and increasingly coordinated to protect the rights of women and promote their interests. Numerous group activities have been undertaken and more are being planned. Countrywide opposition to 137 and countrywide support for no less than 40% representation have been well and increasingly expressed. Recently, for example, sit-ins focusing on these two issues were successfully conducted all across the country. There are only three women on the 25-member IGC. I'm not completely informed, but I heard that only two members support the minimum 40%. Both are men. We have a very steep mountains to climb. Thank you. Okay, we'll open it up for questions. We have the microphones on each side. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll begin right down here, Anita, uh, towards the front. Should I sit down or be here? As what you, do you prefer. Think? Would you like to stand or sit? It uh, doesn't matter. I think I'd like to sit. Okay. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trudy Rubin from the Philadelphia Inquirer. I'd like to ask you to speak a little bit more about 137, how it happened and what it says about the future. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about this process by which it was pushed through and why didn't the three women on the council do anything about it? And also, um, Paul Bremer has said that he won't sign it, but once there is a transition, how do women's groups across the country prevent this from becoming law, especially since groups like Skiri and others are uh, in support of it and claiming that it doesn't hold women back? Well, it's the highly questionable process that it was passed that scares me and scares many Iraqi women, and I must say even men. Uh, there is a wide opposition even among men uh, on this resolution and the way it was passed. Uh, it was passed in, in, a, in, a, in an afternoon session when there wasn't full attendance by the governing council. Uh, there was very close voting, 10 to 11, um, which means four were absent. And um, it, is, uh, it has been passed without enough discussion when, without transparency, without even talking about it before. And it's that, that process that, that I'm personally against. In the new Iraq, we should not pass on resolutions that are so important in that way. We should be thinking much more uh, carefully and, and openly and, and create a debate on it. Now, even though Ambassador Bremer did not agree to sign or approve this resolution, we are still fearful because the Governing Council has not retracted that resolution yet. And uh, you're right, uh, the voices who passed on are still insisting that uh, they don't see any problem with that and they wanted to, to uh, they may bring it up after 30th of June. And it's for that reason that most of the women group who are actively working now and, and um, demonstrating and writing uh, uh, memos and meeting different uh, IGC members is requesting that the uh, resolution officially be retracted by the IGC, but also to make enough conditions in the interim constitution that will not allow such an incident to happen again. And that's why women are, are, are very much um, insistent on enshrining the, the UN convictions, uh, especially uh, UN um, uh, declarations against discrimination of all form of discrimination against women. It's one of the demand of women group that this kind of law um, also get into and become source, or in general UN uh, human rights um, convictions become source of, uh, of legislation in future Iraq. And that is, will be part of the debate that the um, IGC will be busy with in the coming days in, in defining the role of religion in the future. Um, the, um, it's part of the um, uh, important points. And as I said, there is um, a lot of men, members in the IGC who were against it and um, as far as the three women member, I know one, one of them supported it. Um, the others were either not voted or one of them was not present. Um, in any case, when you have only three women in a council that deals with women issues, they are a minority and you cannot guarantee, uh, you can depend on only that small number. And that's why the demand for 40% representation in the future council. Other questions uh, for Aunt Hala? And then uh, back. Next one will be back, uh, Nita. Uh, Hello, Hala. Nice to have you, Nita, again. A uh, follow up question on this. I mean, uh, we know that in the committee which is drafting the Constitution, there is not a single woman, and there are not even women adv as advisors to the members of the uh, committee. I mean, how do you foresee that women's rights? would be even uh, honored or mentioned if you really have only a group of men who are deciding on this. And then a quick uh, question regarding your ministry. Uh, do you have to 
go to the IGC every time you want to initiate a program or do you have enough autonomy to decide yourself and who allocates the budget for these different ministries? Okay. You're right, there is no woman in the drafting committee, but for all fairness, um, the chairman of the committee, in addition, some of the members are uh, among the pro-women issues. And uh, if you have noticed, one of the drafts uh, for the interim um, uh, constitution does enshrine in it uh, um, a quota system for women, does enshrine in it a uh, human right uh, call for human right um, introduction to the uh, legislative process. Um, as women group, and that is what is increasingly getting active, uh, they are not only relying on the three women members, and I think it's not fair to, to hold them that big responsibility. It's the responsibility for all women to voice their concerns and, and make their needs and, and aspirations clear in Iraq today. Now, since last December, there has been uh, uh, more than four uh, countrywide conferences and many uh, other activities, um, campaigns, uh, demonstrations that discuss particularly the political uh, participation of women and the, uh, the women aspirations on the coming uh, uh, interim uh, law. So th those wishes are being made very clear to the uh, CPA, to the Iraqi Governing Council. There has been a lot of meetings with the members. Um, a lot of support has been expressed. Yes, there is a question on the quota. Why 40? Why not 20? Why not 30? And that's something for women group to, to advocate and, and, um, and call for. Um, on the authority, uh, since I took over in September uh, 3rd, um, I, I clearly received also a list of um, uh, delegation of authority. I, I am in charge of my ministry. I make the decisions. I, I have been given the responsibility to run the sector. I make the policies. I des design the, the, the budget. I spend it based on that budget after it's been approved by the planning and finance and the IGC and, of course, the CPA too. But it is really, um, it's the, each ministry, each Iraqi ministry that are um, designing their own needs and priorities. And, of course, when you put it all together, then it, it is the finance, the planning ministry, and the IGC who decide how to allocate funds. Uh, as I was talking to um, Mr. Uh, Director in the morning, for the first time in Iraq history, it's education, water, health sectors that are getting the highest allocation in the Iraqi budget. First time in history that those sectors get the highest allocation. And first time in Iraqi history that we have a public budget with a clear allocation of where the money would go. Uh, that's on the oil sale. Uh, on the other source of funding, as you know, the uh, U.S. Uh, government funding, the donor, other donor governments, there has been a mechanism that has been established, chaired by the planning minister with a board that has members of specialists, uh, IGC members, economists, who, uh, uh, who are coordinating ministries' needs and communicating to the donor. And, of course, each ministry, as I said, I, I was busy today. Uh, today I will be busy tomorrow and, and yesterday in, in discussing uh, with the World Bank on the portion of the donor uh, communities for the water and sanitation sector. Question here, then the, there will be a question here, and then one back there. Hello. Uh, Lawrence Freeman from Executive Intelligence Review. On the question of infrastructure, I think the figure you have is $20 billion, of which you had about $4 billion. I gather that was for your areas of water management and solid waste. Do you have any idea of how big the total infrastructure costs are? That would include electricity, roads, power generation, schools, and how much of that is being funded. The second question is, you're probably uh, aware that in the press recently, uh, Mr. Chalabi came out and said, well, it doesn't really matter what we said to the intelligence community previously, uh, indicating it may not have been true. Uh, Saddam Hussein is gone, the U.S. military is there. Uh, that's what's important. A lot of the information the U.S. got came from the INC, supposedly defectors, and he's now putting a great deal of question on whether that was accurate or not. I was wondering if you could also comment on that question. Um, 
the um, World Bank assessment team uh, who worked very closely with the Iraqi ministries in August, September, and in, in preparation for the Madrid Donor Conference in October, has estimated Iraq need for infrastructure to be around $70 billion, uh, which mainly electricity, telecommunication, roads, housing, uh, water, and sanitation. Um, of those $70 billion, um, as you know, $18 billion has been made available by the U.S. government, and that is the highest um, donation uh, on grant for the Iraqi reconstruction. The, um, the World Bank also is making some grants uh, available, but also um, some other uh, money for loan, um, the Japanese government. In total, in Madrid, there was pledge for $33 billion. Now, Iraqi um, uh, oil uh, production for 2004 has been estimated to generate $14 billion, and uh, with a bit of it, um, under the supplement, actually, the American um, donation, there is a budget to uh, upgrade the oil industry, which should help Iraqi oil production to raise to, to the um, envisioned $20 billion over 2005 and 2006. With that, uh, I say, um, with depending on the oil and the um, money committed from the donor and the U.S. government, I, I see Iraqi urgent needs for water, sanitation, electricity, education, health to be met within the next three years. Now, uh, Iraq is growing. Iraq is a rich country. It's not a uh, develop, I mean, it's not underdeveloped, so people's need and economic growth needs uh, are expanding. And, and that's hopefully will be met in the future with the, with the Iraqi uh, national resources, especially with the investments and the, inv the visions that we have now on expanding the, uh, and diversifying the economic uh, sources for Iraq and not depend only on oil, but uh, depend on other uh, agriculture is one sector that has been getting a lot of attention. Tourism is another important uh, economic sector that we are looking at, and attracting investment for for um, industry and uh, pr production of items. Since Iraq has a very qualified and skilled uh, population, um, I I tend to. Uh, say my personal opinion on the, la la the, the second question. Um, for me, Saddam was the weapon of mass destruction himself. He did use them. He did have them. Uh, I believe it's still there. Um, uh, it is yet to be seen. Um, for me, um, removing Saddam was the um, most important things to, to protect um, Iraqi people, but also to, uh, to, to start really building a democracy in that area. Um, there are a lot of things need to be discovered and known. Unfortunately, I think the, the uh, global terrorism, which is finding its way now in Iraq, is hindering that process, but um, uh, there is a lot of information being gathered locally that is yet to be analyzed. And I would just refer to the future to see what was. But for, um, for me, as an Iraqi person, um, I think he has them, he used them, and he needed to go. Question here, and that will be followed by Mr. Reston in the back. Uh, I'm Catherine Michael. I'm from Iraq. Uh, my question to... Uh, Nasreen Barwari, please. Uh, three women that they are in governing council, they are unqualified women, absolutely, because none of them had background for women's issue. We never heard about that. These three women had been appointed just to please Shia parties. Uh, so uh, my question is, what United Nations doing to expand number of women, not only a woman, not only to bring appointed one woman and to say, oh, we have a three women. We need qualified women to be a decision makers first, second, to be active in the community. And they have at least background to know what's the 137, for example, one of them had been asked, what, do you know why you signed on 137? She said, I didn't know that it is big issue for women. 
this was answer of, of, from women of governing council. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we should be fair. Um, the three women uh, comes with uh, with a background and a quality that um, does have a merit. I think the question is not about them particularly. The question is that it is it is very few to have three women only is very few. And um, to all fairness, they have also grown in the position from the first time they were in the position and now. And and. There were no history of women participation in the political process, so we should also be fair by um, allowing women to grow in the political uh, process. Now, the the 137 and why women didn't stop it, I, I agree with you uh, that there should be enough study uh, about it and analysis, but I think we should not blame them. We should blame the institution that, that introduced it in such a hasty way. And, and with the three only women voices, we should not depend totally on, on, um, on protection of women issues on them only. The women issue should be a, a national agenda. It should be uh, an agenda adopted by everybody, men and women, uh, outside the governing council and inside, outside the transitional national assembly, the future and inside it. Um, the UN uh, do have a role to play, and I think that... Um, Women issue, human rights issues, um, election, constitution drafting is one of the, the roles that UN can play and, and have an experience with in other uh, countries that went through the same that is Iraqi. And that's why the Iraqi Governing Council and Iraqi people are calling for a UN role in the rebuilding pro political rebuilding process. And also the coalition provisional authority is also supportive of a role for a woman. So, um, the, 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 the UN conventions, and con I mean, they have a lot of uh, literature on um, women empowerment, women participation, and uh, obviously if, a if the UN will play an active role, um, that's uh, a guarantee, but then a lot of work needs to be done by the women group to organize themselves, which is happening. Okay, question here, Mr. Reston, and then there'll be another question back there, Maria Stella. I'm Jim Reston, a, a scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Just to reflect what Mr. Hamilton said, uh, we greatly admire what you're doing, the difficulty of the task, and wish you well. Um, whenever elections are held in Iraq, one would think, at least from an American standpoint, that the winning argument on the stump, as we say here, would be virulently anti-American given the unpopularity of the occupation. Does that not suggest that the government that comes out of such a free election would itself almost by definition be virulently anti-American? How would that process be controlled? How do you see that happening? Um, and is there any way to, um, to uh, get a final result in which that final government is not so anti-American? I think the transfer of authority in June 30th <coughs> will, will change a lot of the perception that exists maybe outside Iraq and to some extent inside Iraq. I don't say that uh, there is an anti, like there is a national feel of anti-coalition. Uh, many people in Iraq are worried what will happen after 30th of, uh, of June, especially uh, security is a concern. How will that be managed by Iraqi alone, considering that nowadays security threat is coming from outside Iraq. It's not inside Iraq. Otherwise, if it is inside Iraq, the Iraqi people can coordinate among themselves and organize and, and maybe keep it under control. But now that we are increasingly com uh, you know, um, uh, assured, or at least uh, evidence is, is clearly showing that people who are doing the uh, horrendous uh, suicide bombing are people from outside Iraq, this does bring in the concern of Iraqi people. So um, I would think after June 30th, um, the, um, if there is an anti-American, that will be reduced. Um, the election and who will the election bring to power is a concern not only for American, it's a concern for Iraqi too. Uh, and that's why 
it's not time for election today. Um, we need to, to, um, to go through a period of transformation at society level, at, at political level. Our political institution need to be um, maturing. Uh, this is only 10 months that uh, it was allowed um, different parties to function. Um, so there is a lot of education that needs to be happening before any election. And even today, if election happens, the result would be dangerous not only for the American, it will be dangerous for the Iraqi themselves, and even for women, if I may say. Um, so um, that is part of the struggle that, that Iraqis are sensing, thinking about, considering it very seriously, and are struggling to put the right framework in the coming, um, let's say, one year, um, so that the outcome could provide security and safety and peacefulness to Iraqi people and to outside also. Question in the back. Hi, I'm Catherine Porter with the Human Rights Alliance. It's very nice to see you here in the United States okay. and particularly at the Wilson Center. We're hearing that the population in Iraq is composed of 65% female. I'm wondering how uh, you came up with a quota of 40% uh, for women. And I'm wondering further how women in the United States can help women in Iraq. There is a lot of participation with women in Afghanistan, but less so in terms of Iraq. And I'm wondering if you have some ideas on that. Thank you. I tend to be realistic in all my approaches and all the numbers I use. Uh, I know that 65% has been used by some media source, but um, in my discussion with the planning ministry who have a, a center for census, they tell me that the um, women population in Iraq is between 54 to 55 percent. It's not 60 per five. But I, um, I would still leave it open until we conduct a uh, proper census because, you know, the former, the, the previous census were questionable, their, their credibility. Um, but even if we are talking about 55 percent, um, uh, the 40 the percent has came up uh, depending on um, a lot of um, suggested um, quota system in the UN uh, resolutions, uh, especially there is a resolution 1532, um, I guess. Uh, it, is, uh, it is calling upon all governments, national government, to promote equal and just representation of women in the political process and any uh, representative bodies in the governments. Um, I think we need today in Iraq uh, to ensure the quality of participation and the involvement of the different issues that women are uh, affected by in the, in the society today, economically, socially, politically, legally. We need that pool of women to be in the process that is making the decisions so that we can get a, a wide coverage. Um, it is for that sense that we did not call for 55%. Uh, we're calling for no less than 40%. But we're saying no less. So we're open for 60 and 70 even if it happens in the future. Um, there is, a, um, there is a, a role for uh, American women NGOs or any global women NGOs network to help Iraqi women. You know, this is a new process for Iraqi women to assemble and to start organizing and, 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 um, and, and calling for, for, for certain, um, uh, you know, or, or voicing their aspiration. They need help in organizing themselves. They need help in, in the, at the legal uh, front on, on how to argue, how to present their argument. They need to, to also help in, in training on how to stand for voting, how to stand for election. Uh, they need um, um, administrative help, financial help, uh, we should not um, depend on government funding to, uh, for women uh, group. Uh, in that sense, I think networking would be very helpful to help Iraqi women to gain some of the expertise that has been maturing across the, the, the globe. 
And if we take a lot of um, examples of countries that adopted the quota system, like South Africa, Kosovo, to some extent uh, Afghanistan, uh, I think there is a lot of uh, merits in that system, and Iraq today needed. And we need it especially after what we saw with 137. And, and for that, um, we're looking forward for networking, participation, help, and an upgrade of skills for, for Iraqi women. Uh, there's uh, quite a few hands up. Anita has a question here. Anita, we'll take uh, one more question after this, and we'll recognize the lady uh, here. Anita Sharma with the Conflict Prevention Project at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Minister Barari, it's a pleasure to have you here at, at the center again. My question is regarding the four months that you have before the transition uh, of power, and the question is the transition to whom, the handover to whom. Um, looks like elections are not going to happen, as you had said. Um, we might see an expanded governing council so in your talks around town and in your meetings with the various groups, World Bank, UN, uh, U.S. government ad administration officials, how do you foresee that transition of power? How is it going to affect your ministries? Who will you be coordinating with? Uh, in, will it be uh, the Governing Council, the United Nations? Um, just how you see things affecting within four months? It's not very much time in, in terms of planning. Um, in Iraq today, uh, it's no, not anymore uh, about the minister or the person. It's about the institution. And uh, in my talk, I'm talking about the institution, which will still be there, whether the governing council is changing, whether the, uh, the minister is changing. It's about the sector and the sector need uh, and the sector that has been managed by an institution that existed before the war and is now developing and will continue to develop. So um, we are developing, and I talk about my ministry, we're developing a vision that, that, uh, that will lead the development and the transforma transformation of my ministry into a decentralized, uh, effective, efficient, closer to the people that serves the people. And, and for that, we have a very um, um, clear objective to reach. And it's those kind of uh, measurable objectives that we are discussing with those institutions which need to be carried out, uh, whether I'm the minister or somebody else. Uh, so we're trying to build the institutional capacity and, and build the institutional framework that will continue to function based on, on um, objective measures. It's not based on the wish of the um, the majority of the governing council, of the wish of uh, me personally per se, we're applying some technical tools to, to identify our priorities and needs and what the sector needs and how can it improve the quality of life for Iraqi people. So when, we, when I go and talk, it's about the sector needs, it's about the institution, it's about the capacity building of the staff who will be there always. As of who, uh, I think the Transitional National Assembly is, is a body that will be created, and it's been named that way, and there is no change of that name. Um, uh, the CPA and the IGC are still working toward the transfer of authority based on the agreement that they both signed on 15th of November, whose everybody is supportive of it, including all Iraqi people are united to, to that uh, agreement. Uh, it is the detail of how, how will that be expanded and who will be in it. And um, as I said, um, there is a need for expansion. There is a need of inclusion of more people, definitely more women. And then we need a steady executive body, not rotative or changing, and a strong prime minister who will bring the power to what it needs to be done at the end of the day. It's about people and how can any government or governing structure improve the quality uh, of, um, of the uh, Iraqi people's lives. Final question here. I'm sorry, we won't be able to get to all the questions. The minister has a meeting at the World Bank uh, schedule. Thank you, Minister Barari. My name is Rina Shah, and um, I work in Senator Mikulski's office, and we've been following this issue, and uh, certainly we've been putting a lot of pressure on Paul Bremer himself um, because we feel that a lot of responsibility 
does lie uh, with the CPA and with the selection, the U.S. Um, selection of the CPA. And uh, this is a larger question in that where does the accountability lie? Uh, when they were putting the CPA together, there was so much focus on making sure that minorities were represented in different parts um, of Iraq. In the IGC. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it's I'm okay. so sorry. It's okay. Yes, the IGC. Um, the CPA was uh, putting so much emphasis on the fact that the IGC should represent so many minorities and all of that, but obviously the women weren't considered. And it seems like a recurring thing if um, last year the hot topic was women in Afghanistan, this year's should be women in Iraq. But why is that not more integrated in general? And is that a failure um, of sort of the U.S.? in a certain way of not infusing that. So I'm just uh, curious about the accountability factor on the U.S. and what you feel about that. And then, in general, legislatively, uh, what we can be doing, uh, not just the NGO sector, but legislatively, what you might expect of us. I think it's, um, it's fair also to, to mention that um, the Iraqi political reconstruction is an Iraqi matter. And it is um, what I have, I mean, I've met Ambassador Bremer several times on the women issues. And I, I really um, appreciate his uh, position that it should be an Iraqi issue that should be dissolved. But of course, as, as, as an administrator, uh, he's very much supportive of the women issues, of participation of women. But... Um, to all fairness, he doesn't want to interfere into this. And, and that's why I say we as, as people, and especially as women, I think it's more sustainable that we depend on ourselves in, 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 in trying to, to uh, push our aspiration and demand clearly. But obviously, uh, because it is governed by two sides, it's the IGC and the CPA, we're very active trying to meet with both sides and trying to um, promote our aspiration and needs there. The, uh, uh, the expansion of the IGC is going to include a newer um, groups, and that's the whole point of it. Uh, hopefully it will include more women. That's part of the demand. Uh, as I said, there is a, an understanding in the IGC for that fact too, with not, not completely, not the majority of the IGC, but that's uh, a fact really, but need to be pressured more and more. Um, we are um, confident that there is um, some group in the IGC, men, uh, who are supportive of uh, women uh, participation and will promote that through the drafting process. Um, the quota system is being pushed. Uh, I see maybe at the end of the day, if 40% won't be approved, it will be something between 25 and 30, which is still better than what we have today. So um, let's, let's – um, I'm optimistic, and I feel the pressure that we have worked on uh, has worked, and of course CPA is supportive of that, and not so much on the quota system, but on the representation. Um, legal – I mean, legislation-wise um, – uh, I think Iraq will need a lot of support and help and guidance, and that's why I said uh, we welcome a role for the UN that can guide the process of constitution writing. There is a lot of education that is needed at societal level of what does it mean, each, each, each paragraph, each article that will govern the relationship between center and regions, between uh, men and women, between uh, um, parliament uh, and, and ministers. I mean, all of these questions are being thought of. There are drafts in place. I think for it to be adopted um, at the population level, there is a lot of education that is needed. No, there is no culture of democracy in Iraq, as you understand. It is starting. There is a lot of uh, things happening. But there is a lot of needs for consultancy, for um, um, maybe the IGC. And I'm, I know that they are seeking assistance and they have help. But in the coming six months, there should be – we should think of a process um, that can uh, ensure – the fears and aspiration of all Iraqi groups that should be enshrined in the uh, constitution, the permanent constitution. And there is enough examples in the history, I think, of solutions that ha or frameworks that were adopted at the end. 
and, and that could maintain stability, political stability, and personal security for all Iraqi people, north, south, center, Christian Muslims, Turkoman Yazidis. I mean, everyone in Iraq today and in the future should feel safe and should never go back to what they have seen before. And that should be our guiding uh, rule to maintain stability and personal security. As we conclude, I think we finally got the heat on in here. Uh, <laughs> But the rather frigid temperatures in here do, uh, during the meeting certainly do not reflect the warmth of our reception for you and the warmth of our appreciation for the work that you do uh, in Iraq. It's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, we are concluded. Thank you for coming.